put out that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Energy Week with George Harvey and the amazing Tom Fennell. In the flesh. In the flesh. <laughs> I want to start this program out with an advertisement. We're not supposed to advertise, but this is, we're not asking for money. We're not selling anything. We're just, <laughs> this is, I'm advertising this fact. Um, the VCAN conference is coming up. You're going to go to VCAN. What's VCAN? It's the one up in Farley. Yeah, I think I've been up to that. Yeah, I think you have. What been. does VCAN stand for? I don't know. You know, <laughs> Vermont, you've got uh, Vermont. V probably stands for Vermont. Probably. Vermont has, is a state of acronyms, and all of them have V in it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't keep them straight. But the VCAN conference is a conference that has, um, has uh, you know, people, a lot of people from energy committees go there. And it has uh, a, just a lot going on. You can, you know, they have a good lunch and, and you can get together and talk with people. And they have a keynote speaker, keynote, two keynote speakers this year, one of whom is Bill McKibben. Okay. And um, then... It, he usually knows what he's talking he about. He generally knows what he's talking <laughs> about. <laughs> anyway, it is, you know, a thing that I think is, is really... <coughs> One of the, it's one of the best things on, on, um, I around in terms of ag the conferences and things like that that happen in Vermont, and it's, uh, it's really good, and I would suggest that anybody who's interested in energy and is in Vermont or even New Hampshire go there. Fairly is about halfway up the eastern side of the state. <coughs> And it's at the, it's on the lake, you see. It's on the Lake yeah. Morley Resort, which is, uh, which is uh, a beautiful place. And it's happening on Saturday, the 1st of December. It starts at 9 a.m. Uh, you're far better off uh, if you want to go registering in, in advance. And you can do that by going to vcan.net. V-E-C-A-N is vcan, um, dot net. And... Um, we can't and we can. Yeah, it's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if you go to vecan.net, you can you can get into it and um, register. I generally go uh, as a on a press pass, so oh, okay. I, I I get a free lunch. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it's definitely worth going. Um, Let's see. Well, let's start off today with a picture. Yeah, well, let's start today with a picture. This is something that we've talked about a bunch before. Well, I get the picture of it. Yeah, that's there a good idea. Help. There you go. <laughs> Come on, picture. There it is. There it is. And this is, um, this is a, uh, a, an article that came from Energy Storage News. Okay. What a neat name for a publication. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> What do you got for title, Tom? Remote Scottish Island uses ultra caps, flywheels, and hybrid microgrid to go. Almost 100% renewable. Yeah. Ultra caps. Um, what are they, Tom? Well, it's according to the article, it's a high capacity capacitor. <laughs> high capacity capacitor. With capacitance values much higher than other capacitors. Uh, but low, lower voltage limits that bridge the gap between electrolytic capacitors, which is a whole other thing, and rechargeable <laughs> batteries. So somewhere between a capacitor and a battery. Yeah, this, these they are typically store 10 to 100 times more energy than electrolytic capacitors. So these things store a lot of energy. Yeah. But the problem is they dump it quickly. Yes. Okay. <laughs> they can accept and deliver charge much faster than batteries and can tolerate many more charge and discharge cycles. Yeah. You're going to be hearing more about these I, things. We, as they we've been hearing about them in the past. And the other thing, too, is there's, there's flywheels on this. And flywheels discharge quickly, too. You know, they, they, these, these things. Well, yeah, flywheels are interesting. There's one of them right on a Vermont, New York border over uh, near Pittsfield. Yeah. And uh, it's not like a record player. No, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a cylinder. It looks like a drum. And, and it's spinning all the time, and uh, they use the motion of it spinning 
to s save energy uh, yep. or re send it back to the grid. So the, f the more energy that's in it, the faster it spins. It's, it's a neat thing. Okay, <laughs> let me read this. The remote Isle of Egg, which is spelled E-I-G-G -G and pronounced a bunch of different ways. A bunch of different words. The, the, the word I, I got off the net was Ikka. Ikka. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that too, but I've also I've seen egg more more often. One of the uh, the Scottish Inner Hebrides is now host to a hybrid microgrid, which incorporates flywheels and ultra capacitors for uh, high power functions, as well as solar batteries, wind, and diesel backup, and that's where it, why it's almost. Almost, uh, 100%. almost 100 percent. And that diesel backup used to provide the I island with its electricity. That's where they got it, yeah. And so they mm -hmm. had this really high-priced electricity, I mean really, really high-priced, high -priced for a small <laughs> group of people. I think every... Like 100. Yeah, I think it might have been everybody on the, on the island was hooked up, I don't know. Well, according but, to the articles, 100 permanent... Uh, okay. Permanent but the diesel inhabitants. had to be operated, and it wasn't operated 24 hours a day. Okay. <laughs> so they didn't have 24-7 electricity when they were on fossil fuels. Okay. And we will get back to that. Um, I, maybe it's next week. I think there's, a, there's another one that's coming let's, up. Let's take a look at this picture here anyhow. Yeah. It looks like a huge set of uh, turbines, but actually they're quite small. They're small turbines. They're only about 50 feet tall. Yeah. You, you can actually tell by the shape of them that they're, that they're small. That they're different. Yeah. Yeah. You can definitely... So they're not anywhere near as big, but in the picture, there's no reference point. There's nobody standing there. Yes, that's true. You can't really tell. You know, we didn't do the, the, the daily, weekly introduction, and I should do that so people know what, what this is what all about. What they're watching here? Yeah, well, this is Energy <laughs> Week. Uh, every day I get up and I, I, I do internet searches um, on I renewable energy, um, climate change, and so forth. And in the normal days searches, I probably do look at about 400 articles. Really? Well, I'm talking about just the headlines. Just the headline, yeah, I, yeah. And then um, maybe 25 or 30 articles I actually open up, and out of those, 50, 10 to 15 are chosen to put into For your blog. the blog, which is geoharvey.com, G-E-O-H-A-R-V-E-Y. And this week, uh, we're recording on Wednesday because tomorrow is Thanksgiving. So today is the 21st, and we start with where we left off the previous week. So this first article that we just talked about is at geoharvey.com. Again, it's G-E-O-H-A-R-V-E-Y.com. And it is on Thursday, November 15th. And if you click on the calendar for the 15th of November, you'll find a set of probably 15 articles, of which this is one. So we're basically talking about the best of the blog. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. The top three articles on a daily basis. On a daily basis, usually and, the top and three. Some of these things are well written and in depth. And, yeah. uh, you know, we could, we could, as I've said before, spend the whole show just, just on one of them one sometimes, of them, yes, but absolutely. we don't really have time. We could talk for an entire show about f fires in California and the Trump administrations. We could. So we're going to talk a little bit about them on the way today. Things that they say about them. Okay, should we go on to the next one? Well, let's see. There's uh, see what I, notes More about I have the about island of egg. One. We're still on egg here. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's about lead, lead acid batteries provide the storage, but they can't unload them quick enough, so they've got these flywheels right. and these particular ultra caps to take the place in, the, in switching out from one kind of energy to another. And we're talking about seconds here. We're not talking Actually, about long periods of time. Actually, ultra caps, you can switch on energy uh, from ultra caps, I think, in... Tenth of a second or, you know, tiny fractions, fractions of a second. Fractions of a second, yeah. So they kick in to preserve the charge in the batteries. And it's... You know, for 100 people, it must have some pretty bright people here because whoever designed this system knew what they Knows were doing. Knows what they're doing, yeah. <laughs> Although I'm a little surprised that they're using lead-acid batteries because that technology is getting old. But Well, I'm sure they had a reason for it. And I've seen pictures of the batteries, and they don't look that it, like the battery in your car. You know, there right. are batteries that you are know made what? for we this. Should, we should talk about one day. There's a battery called the Cambridge battery, I think it's called. I don't know anything It's about in a it. museum. Uh -huh. And it is a, it's a dry battery, and it has you a... Mean totally dry? Yeah, totally oh, okay. dry. 
and it, it operates a pendulum. It just drives a pendulum. And this oh, okay. battery was assembled <laughs> something like 160 years ago. Okay. And it's been going ever since. <laughs> I think I've read about that. Yeah, it's still working. Yeah. yeah, there's lots of different ways you can do batteries. Okay, are we uh, ready for Let's move on next to California. Week? California, here. Clean Technica is the source of this. California invests in, quote, by location distributed energy resources. California leads the U.S. in several pilot projects to reward rooftop solar energy generators and other distributed energy resources in specific locations as an alternative to having the utility meet needs by investing in upgrading their electricity generation networks. Well, what it's saying here is customers pay a high price for electricity transmission and distribution infrastructure. Right. The high lines. Yeah. Okay. Close to five cents per kilowatt hour. So that's about a third of what you're paying for your electricity. Yep. And if utilities spend money for new generation capabilities, the to... cost is headed toward higher bills. Right. But what basically are saying with distributed energy, you don't need this kind of infrastructure anymore. Right. So it's morphing. Yeah. One of our very earliest shows, today, by the way, is I think our 292nd show, one of our really early shows. Which it would is have been, 292. Yep. Yeah, it would have been something like five years ago. We talked about um, the fact that the Long Island, what's the, what's the utility on Long Island? Vulco, Long Island Lighting. Okay. Um, Long Island Lighting had planned to spend um, almost half a billion dollars on a transmission project going out to eastern Long Island. And we're, they, all the, we're all the wealthy people there. Yeah, and they canceled <laughs> the project. Yeah, because it wasn't necessary. It wasn't necessary. These wealthy people were putting in solar um, systems to supply their houses with electricity. Yeah. And because of that, the increased population was not being matched by an increase in demand. So a lot of money was saved by the fact that a few people were putting mo uh, solar panels on their rooftops. Mm -hmm. Even though they weren't providing any electricity for the grid, they, were they weren't using, weren't it using the electricity. Yeah. So it's a little second order consequence. You don't yes, think it about is. much. Yeah. Okay, you have more on that one? Uh, I don't think I do. So let's uh, talk about Bloomberg. Okay. Next one up. Our next one is also from Clean Technica. Lo and behold, Bloomberg confirms U.S. coal on track for record capacity decline. This is BNEF, which is Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Research giant, energy research giant, Blue, Bloomberg New Energy Finance confirmed that U.S. coal plant retirements are nearing an all-time high. With well, that's sort of what we've been talking yeah, about. Yeah, it sure is. With at least 16 gigawatts of coal-fired plants already retired in 2018 and a, 30, and a further 37 gigawatts expected to retire in the U from the U.S. market by 2025. Well, that 37 gigawatts is significant. That's nearly a quarter yeah. of the United States coal-fired fleet. Right. So they're putting these things out of business pretty quickly. They are indeed. And it's because they're expensive. It's because Donald Trump <laughs> has declared war on coal and never bothered telling anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we got another picture here coming. We do here. indeed, and this is, uh, we are up to Friday, November 16th, and this is an interesting picture. Uh, well, this so is a real picture of Block Island. Yeah, keep that picture up because I want to talk about that a little bit. All righty. Okay. Developers propose adding an additional 350 megawatts of offshore wind power. That's only part of the story. Yeah. And we'll be talking about this a little later, more on it. We will indeed. Uh, this is from NewportRI.com. Uh, Rhode Island has tripled the state's supply of renewable energy in the last two years on the way to a 1,000 megawatt goal, according to Governor Gina Raimondo. Now developers uh, answering a call for proposals for offshore wind power have entered bids for as much as 350 megawatts. Well, we will be talking about this again. Yep. But the basically... They've got 30 megawatts going down, which is really small. It's I mean, it's small. only about, what, five turbines out there? Yeah. Five, six, something There's like that. There's five turbines in the, in the Block Island. Uh, uh, but they've firm. got plans already in place to buy another 400 megawatts. Yep. They just haven't paid for it yet. Well. 
And now they're, now they're proposing, they went for a rest, request for quotations, and they got quotations for another additional 350 megawatts. Mm -hmm. So right off the coast of Rhode Island, we're looking at more than a, a gigawatt. Yeah. So it's, the I, times they are changing. This picture, if you look at it, there's, there's some interesting things going on there. The base of this thing, I can't read it here, I think it says 98 feet. I can't um, read it either. Well, in the, in the yellow part of the base, it yeah, says BIWF3, it, it. and it, there's a, a reference to 98 feet, which I think might be the height of that position above um, uh, sea level, which would mean that th those things are about 600 feet tall, I would guess. Which, the yellow things? Yeah. That's no, 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 the, the whole mast. Everything. Yeah. Okay. All right. I hear you. I okay. Hear you. But on the on the on the left side of that, what you see is a bunch of apparatus, which is really just a series of ladders. Yeah. That you can climb up. Now, when you get to the the top of that yellow area, there's a walkway that goes around yep. that. Yep. On the left side of that wa walkway, you see some yellow apparatus, and when I saw that, I said to myself, you know what? I'll bet that's a crane. Uh -huh. And I looked, and yes, indeed, other pictures of the same things taken from di different angles show that, in fact, that is a crane. And, in fact, one of the pictures I came across showed one of those things in use. They're so you can lift things out of boats that okay. come up for... for now. So the crane is, is permanent? It's permanent crane. Every one of these... these uh, yeah, they all have one. Have yeah, they all have one. Yeah, but another see. thing, on the other side of the same walkway, you see some funny dark rectangles. <laughs> kind of looks like uh, solar panels. They have it? solar panels on this thing. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, I was looking at that. They, they look like solar panels. And I'll bet they've got batteries on there too. So those solar panels can charge batteries, which are used by the wi wind farm technicians when there's no electricity from any other It doesn't sound source. like it makes sense, but it does. It does indeed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So we talked about ar the article. So. Uh, <coughs> Developers are now proposing to sell an additional 350 megawatts of yep. offshore wind power. There's more coming, folks. There's more coming. And this is just Rhode Island because Massachusetts is playing in the same ball so ballpark. So is New York State and so well, is Virginia. Well, yeah, but Massachusetts is right so is adjacent New Jersey to this. And, yes. But yeah, all up and down all the up East and Coast. Down, all up and down the East Coast. I think down to North Carolina, maybe South Carolina. There's At least to North Carolina. At least yep, to North there, Carolina. And well, I guess we've talked already about one of them that's in Virginia. Yep. Okay. So our next item comes from Bloomberg Quint. More Bloomberg. More huh? Bloomberg. I don't know what Quint is, but <laughs> this America's is America's wind farms are ready to go it alone. Yep. For a quarter century, the wind industry has been supported by federal tax credits that helped it attract investments of $250 billion. Now... That support comes to an end next year, and I've been told, by the way, that, um, um, hold on just a second, I want to make sure that I've got my computer working here. Um, I've been told that that, uh, Tad Montgomery told me that this, that that thing of it ending next year is not correct, so. So they're going to extend it? No, it's already been extended. But, oh, okay. But analysts and executives say the credits have done what they were supposed to do, make the industry competitive. Well, that's true. It's true. But there's a question, and the question is, should we continue the, the uh, credits or should we stop them? And I would advocate continuing them, even though they aren't needed to make wind tur turbines um, competitive. And the reason... Why is that? Because the coal industry and the natural gas industry are killing people. Yeah. About 330 people per year. And in, they're getting in, support. Yeah. <laughs> but we, you know, if you, if you look at the situation that we've got in this, in this country today, we've got renewable power, we've got solar, we've got wind, we've got geothermal, we've got hydro, we've got, you know, a bunch of different kinds of renewable power. We've got backup for those power. You combine that all together and you get something which, when it's distributed properly in the grid, is actually more reliable and more sustainable and, and more cheaper, um, cheaper, cheaper <laughs> as well than, than what we've had in the past. We can make ourselves more comfortable on less money than we had in the past. And in doing that, we stop the air pollution. And that means that we stop people dying and that also means that we stop 
the the money that we're spending because of pollution on medical costs. On medical, yeah. Now, if you took the, that's a real cost. Medical costs are real costs. How much for Vermont? About a, about six hundred and fifty million dollars a year. What is that for each? Well, it comes to about a thousand dollars per person per year. That now, we're paying, whether we like it or not. That we're paying, whether we like it or not, for medical costs. It doesn't count yeah. the fact that people are dying. It just says people are getting Get, sick. Yeah. And the medical costs. Now, I will back that up by saying that the American um, uh, 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 the Lung Association in California did a study of Vermont. I've mentioned this many times. They said our use of fossil fuels for transportation cost us $480 per person per year. And that's 40, uh, 48, it's roughly 48% of, of the fuel that we use, 47%. Our, if you extend that figure the same way into other uses of fossil fuels, which are less regulated than transportation, by the way, in general, um, it would mean $1,000 per person per year. And that's, you know, an extrapolation of figures, of figures, but a fair extrapolation of figures from the American Lung Association. And so we're in a transition period. We're in a transition period. Which is a period. good thing, I think. But if, if we want to, to reduce those costs, yeah. if we want to deal with climate change, yeah. if we want to stop killing people, we got to do something. We, we have to do proactive. something. We have to be proactive. And so I'm advocating being proactive. Okay, makes sense to me. Okay. Uh, moving right along here. All right. Our next one is from PV Magazine International. U.S. energy firm AES commits to 70% carbon reduction in climate scenario report. AES is one of the world's largest power companies, and it has released a report detailing the company's move to reduce carbon emissions 70% by 2030. That's not that far into the future. The report also makes projections on the environmental and energy transmission impacts of this move. Well, the article goes into detail about what AES is doing, and I don't want to bore everybody with a <laughs> report on it, <laughs> primarily because they didn't make notes about it. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it, it makes sense for AES because it's making money for them. Yeah. Bottom line. Bottom line. We are, we are in... We are at a turning point. We've already hit the turning point where renewable energy is cheaper than fossil fuels. And the well, utilities- Well, we've probably been there for a long time, but it was sort of concealed from us. Well, yeah. Buried I mean, costs and something. Yeah, there's a lot of that. Like that. But it's, it's actually at a point now where it's undeniable. You can't, yeah, right, exactly. It, it really is. You, you try to bring electricity to market, and if it comes from coal, or, or natural gas even, it's not competitive with wind power at, at wind power's cheapest at and all. And it's still going down, and so yes. solar. Yes. So it's an interesting uh, co development here. Yes. So you sell your stock in large electric well, power companies. Yeah, we're not, we're not um, <laughs> financial advisors, but sell your stock. <laughs> Well, let's move along here. We got a very interesting picture. We do indeed, up and we're up to Saturday, November seventeenth. I'm going to put the picture up. See if anybody can figure out what it is. <laughs> oh, that is a robot. I guess. And it's in the VW plant in Zwickau. Zwickau. Z well, what? It, you, you, the the, the <laughs> German Z is pronounced like a, Zwickau, like a T S, and oh, the Zwickau, huh? Yeah, and the double. <laughs> Volkswagen, Volkswagen, no, no. <laughs> converting Zwickau automotive plant to produce electric vehicles. This is actually an interesting article. Yeah, it is. And it's a long article. There's a lot of pictures in it, and it's kind of fun article. Yeah, Volkswagen, or or as they say, VW, which in German is VW, because a V is pronounced like an F, uh -huh. and a W is pronounced like a V. Uh -huh. They just scrambled the al alphabet. <laughs> Uh, Volkswagen is, uh, let's see, in a move that it believes is the first of its kind in the world for a major car factory, VW is converting its auto factory in Zwickau, Germany, 
to, uh, from internal combustion vehicle production to manufacturing electric vehicles. The plant makes 330,000 cars per year. So, so that they're, they're expecting to sell a lot of electric vehicles. They're expecting vehicles. to sell a lot of electric vehicles. They're getting vehicles. in line now doing it. Yep, and they had, you know, the, the guy who's the, I don't know if he's the general manager of VW or he's the, I forget what his title is, but he, he's been saying, we're going to have v, uh, uh, vehicles that are as good as Tesla's, but they're going to cost half cost as much. cost a lot less. Yeah. Well, v, VW kind of goofed about a year ago with their faking of some of the ex exhaust tests. Yes. So this is at least part of their goal yes. to overcome that. Yes. And they're doing it by saying we're getting we're going into electric vehicles and we're going in big. Yep. The 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 goof in the exhaust tests, by the way, um, was somebody at VW had figured out that if you if you used certain sens sensors in the car, you could tell whether it was being you uh, whether it was being tested for emissions. Yeah, so they <laughs> and the the key here, one of the keys was that if it's being tested for emissions, you will not have anybody turning the 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 front wheels. So <laughs> if the front wheels are are you know if nobody's yeah, steering yeah. the car, then it's logical to say, well, this is probably an emissions test. And when you have uh, an emissions test going on, you run it one way so that you reduce emissions. Sure. When you don't have an emissions test turning on, uh, going on, then you run it the other way so the car feels peppy and, and produces more emissions. And every VW being made that was a diesel had this, this software in it that would tell, you know, to cheat yeah. on, on emissions yeah. testing. So they got into a lot of uh, trouble, and they have, have so far hit fines that are worth about half of their um, market capitalization as it was so before this happened. They've, so they've been hit pretty hard. They've been hit hard. They've been hit very hard. One of the people, I don't know that it wasn't more than one, but at least one of the higher-ups in VW went to prison. So, uh -huh. you know, That rarely happens. It rarely happens, that's right. Well, this article's interesting. There's a lot of pictures in it, and uh, it looks like VW is going to get into electric vehicles big time. Big time. This plant is going to make a basic chassis that's for about six or seven different vehicles. Yes. With a different body on it. Yes. But it's basically the same, same car. Same chassis. Yeah. Okay. Well, they're presently producing the Golf, which, by the way, is not named after a game. It's named after a wind. After a wind? Yeah, the golf. The a golf is a wind in Europe. Oh, okay. Golf is the same as a German, I guess, version of golf. Okay. So it has nothing to do with the game. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> um, that's why the Sirocco. Sirocco is another wind. Yeah, I knew Sirocco was a wind. Yeah. Okay, but let's not move in Europe. along here. Okay, we are up to golf news, and this particular one is golf, is about huh? the golf. <laughs> <laughs> not golf. <laughs> not golf. Golf. Renewable energy to enhance food security across the world. Well, that's good news. This is important, I think. This could make a big, big difference. Adoption of renewable energy will ensure food security across the globe. A top official um, of in... in What's going on here? Well, I've, <laughs> I've got a, a thing going on. There we go. I'm, well, I'm going to get rid of this. Nobody thing. knows what's going on. Here. Well, we, we're, we're being told by the by the computer that shows the uh, the uh, images that it needs to have uh, some new thing or it's going <laughs> to reboot or something. So in order to keep going, we have to stop. But you know, well, let's, anyway, let's move on in this one. Cause yes, this is Gulf News. Um, Adoption of renewable energy will help ensure food security across the globe, a top official of the International Renewable Energy Agency said. Many developing countries lose 30 to 40 percent of their agricultural harvests due to a lack of storage and processing yeah, facilities in rural areas. Yeah, this is a, a huge yeah. amount. And you know, one of the things about a, a growing population in the world is how do we feed all these people? And Renewable energy brought in, and, I, and I'm not saying we shouldn't encourage people to stop making the population grow, because I, I think ultimately, in order to have a good, decent environment, we're going to have to see a shrinking population. We've got too many people. That's my own thought. Mm -hmm. But what this is saying is that we've got 
a certain amount of latitude. We don't have to have to change. We don't have to cut forests down for agricultural land in order to feed people. We've got a much better way of dealing with this. Okay. And what they're saying here is, let's build more places to store this food and store right. it so it doesn't spoil. Yeah. And if you have, you know, you you have a small set of solar panels on the roof, you can operate a small refrigerator. Sure. As a matter of fact, in a lot of countries, uh, there there used to be a, a company, and I, I believe it's still in business, and I forget the name of it, unfortunately, but it, it produced, it, it, it made a, um, an ab absorption cycle refrigerator. Okay. And that refrigerator used solar power to make ice. Okay. And it would it's make like possible. in in bright sunshine it could make two tons of ice a day. Wow, that's and a lot this, of ice. Yeah, and this was <laughs> this was a thing that cost like seven thousand dollars, and it was it was being made for places like. Malaya and, and you know environments like that where you have a lot of people fishing but no electricity to power refrigeration equipment to save the to fish, save, to Preserve store the, the fish. fish yeah. So fishing meant that the fish got converted into fermented fish products or into dried fish or such what because you can do that. Oh, well, they've been doing it for you centuries. Salt it, you know. You yeah, know just think cost. about see, think about the fact that <laughs> in in the 1490s, English um, fishermen were traveling to Newfoundland to to fish for cod, and they were out there for weeks at a time, and then they'd bring the fish back to Europe where it was sold. The, the and they were told Columbus. No. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think this was a couple of years after Columbus was uh -huh. when this started. But nevertheless, some of that fish had been in the hold of a ship without refrigeration for months. Okay. Be you know, so why didn't it go bad? Well, they preserved it. Because they, it they preserved it. it. They, they salted it. Yeah. They knew how to do that. So anyway. Um, now let's move along here. Okay, we have an item here from... Red, green, and blue. Amazing. As Trump's tariffs raise the cost of <coughs> solar installations, Elon <laughs> Musk and Tesla cut their prices. I think this is hysterically funny. <coughs> Tesla, unmoved by tariffs, is reducing prices on its solar systems by 10 to 20 percent in recognition of the progress it has made streamlining its solar sales process by integrating Tesla energy products into its existing high traffic storefronts. Let me explain a little bit about what that means. Yeah. Tesla doesn't have typical automobile agencies like Ford and General Motors do. Right. They have these little stores in downtowns of cities. In shopping malls. Shopping malls yeah. and stuff like that where, well, you're, you can't walk in there and walk out with a car, but you can order a car. It will be delivered to you in a very short period of time. Yeah. So. The storefront operations, and what they're saying here is, we got these retail stores selling cars. Let's sell solar yeah. out of the same place. Out of the same place. And it seems to be making sense and, for and them. And Tesla, you know, Tesla is making solar panels. Tesla is making uh, batteries. Uh, batteries. Tesla is making cars. You know, they can sell them all in a sh in a shop that used to be a Victoria's Secret shop, or you know, something like that. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's a picture in the article of one of the Tesla stores. And it looks it's like a nice it, looking store, yeah, you know. It's absolutely. the kind of thing you're walking through a mall, you're going to check, walk in there and check it out. That's right. You can walk just, out with a car. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> walk out having ordered a car. Um, okay, we are up to Sunday, November 18th. Yeah. And we have and a we talked about talking fire. about. We talked about talking about the fire. Yep. And there is the fire. Yep. It's just one of many, by the way. Yes. Climate change and wildfires. How do we know if there's a link? If is not really a very good word. There is a link. Global warming does not start wildfires. The proximate cause of wildfires may be human carelessness, or it may be a natural event, such as dry lightning from a storm that produces little rain. But global warming does increase the risk of wildfires, and it makes them work worse. And by increasing the risk, I will point out, it is increasing the number. 
Well, right now there's a whole bunch of them all over the country. We're, we're hearing only about the big ones. Yeah. But there's in this article is a map. Yes. And they're spotted it's all over the map. It's absolutely distressing. <laughs> it's just plain. There's about four big ones. Yep. One huge one. Yep. About three very large ones. Yes. And little ones all over the state. Yes, they're they all must, over the There place. must be 50 of them. Yeah. And they are mostly um, brush fires. They're not, they're not forest fires. Not trees burning as they're brushes not, burning. As a matter of fact, if you look at that picture. Let's get it back up again. You can see that this is the forest floor burning and not the trees. And furthermore, you can also see that this is not happening in a forest. That's not a forest. That's just a place where there's a, some trees and, and dry grass, dry brush, dry whatever on the floor, of the, on the ground. And, you know, Donald Trump wound up saying we should be raking the forests yeah, the way they do yeah. in, in <laughs> Finland. And the prime minister of Finland said, what? What? <laughs> I didn't say that. Okay. Well, there's a, the article goes into detail explaining why uh, global warming is increasing or how yeah. the risk of wildfires. And it's worth pursuing. It, it is. It's a good yeah. explanation. It is. Okay. It's, but it, it, there is definitely a connection between these wildflowers and well, climate change. Well, the connection is going to come up it. again because it's, it's, it's the next article. Yep. California wildfires. <clears throat> Trump visits state's deadliest blaze. President Donald Trump went to California to survey the most destructive and deadliest wildfire in its history. He said it had not changed his point of view on climate change, adding, I want a great climate, and we're going to have that, and we're going to have forests that are very safe. That's great. I'm, I'm, how in the I'm world so can confident. he? How can <laughs> how can he be confident when he, he he's not even willing to address the the cause of it? And then you know, I'm not sure he even knows what he's talking about. I mean, even knows what he just said. I don't think he does. <laughs> he's shooting to tell for the head. But you know, I don't know. I. I, I don't know what to say here. I, I find it distressing that we have somebody. I want a great climate and we're going to have that? Sure. How? How is it? <laughs> what's the plan? Show me the plan, Mr. President. Okay. Well, it's interesting here that uh, this is a big fire year and we're getting a lot of news and, about it. Yep. And uh, why is it happening? Well, this article goes into a lot of detail into why and well, how, and the article before it, too, too. For years, I've been telling people fires are getting worse in this country, yeah, and they floods are. are getting worse, and, you know, it just, it goes on and on and on. Okay. Low humidity, warm winds, and a dry ground after a rain-free month. Bingo. Bingo. And, you know, this, the, these droughts that have been going on out west have been going on continuously for years and years and years. Why is that? Well, it's because the climate's changing. Yeah. And it's going to get worse. And the, the, the winds that have traditionally produced our climate on the West Coast are changing. Yes. They're going in different directions. Okay. We now, got that, picture that article, by the way, came from uh, the BBC, and this next article comes from The Guardian. The Guardian. Yeah, this is a, this is a cute little picture here. It's a cute little picture. Let me this, see if I can't get it This little guy here. looks so cuddly, and I, I just think if I gave him a cuddle, his mother would probably tear <laughs> my arms off. <laughs> Well, that is a Sumatran orangutan. Yes. Not an orangutan. <laughs> okay, I'll take your word on that. <laughs> it's an orangutan, and it means man of the forest. I mean, yeah, it does. And the, and the local lore is that this is basically a human being who's very hairy. <laughs> <laughs> well, what the article says is habitat loss threatens all of our futures. World, World leaders, leaders warned. Yep. Since 1970, humanity has wiped out 60% of mammals, birds, fish, and reptiles, according to the latest Living Planet report by the World Wildlife Foundation, or WWF, which has warned that the loss of wildlife is now an emergency that is threatening our civilization. The decline in all life is calamitous. And this is an article that everybody should read. This is a good article to read, yes. Yeah. There's a, a takeaway from that. Yeah. Jane Goodall. Yes. Quote, the most intellectual creature to ever walk Earth is destroying its only home. <laughs> <laughs> I keep coming up with this. Now she was the gorilla lady, wasn't she? Yeah, she, yeah. A, a chimpanzee, yeah. 
Was it chimps? Yeah, it was okay. chimpanzee. Um, and a very impressive woman. Uh, every once in a while, I, you know, Congressman Welsh came down a, f a, f a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. <clears throat> and then he gave a talk, and I went up to him after, and I told him that he should remember a quote that came from Star Trek. And that's in this episode of Star Trek, there's some kind of spiritual entity who is, who is getting energy out of conflict. So he purposely puts people into conflict with each other and even gets to a point where he will make sure that they don't kill each other, they just keep on fighting. And the <laughs> and people, good for the he, good for the he, he gets a whole bunch of Klingons onto the Enterprise and they're fighting and every. Well, at some point they all realize what's happening. And one of the Klingon commanders comes up with this quote, which is, only a fool fights in a burning house. Interesting quote. Isn't it? And that in is, depth. That's an interesting that quote. That is where we are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're in a burning house and people are fighting over it. Okay. We're up to Monday, November 19th, and we've got and a really got another picture coming interesting here. picture here. This, this is, this is, this is kind of neat. Now, let's see. If I push this button. There, there you go. <laughs> that, folks, is Loch Ness. And it's Urquhart. 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 Urquhart? Yeah. <laughs> Urquhart. <laughs> Castle, which is sitting on Loch Ness. Well, uh, the article says Loch Ness hydro plant plans may bring hundreds of jobs and power hundreds of thousands of homes. Ambitious plans for an underground hydro plant. And pay attention. This is underground. It's basically out of sight. At Loch Ness, opposite the iconic Urquhart Castle. So it's going to be on the far bank there. Yeah, I'll talk about that in a second because I okay. looked it up. I was looking at a nice picture here and I'm trying to figure out where that, that uh, hydro plant's going okay. to be. Um, they're go uh, going before the Highland Council. The Red John Pump Station Hydro Project would That's have the name a, of it. Yep, would have a generating capacity of 400 megawatts. That's significant. It's significant. It's only a third Not of the giant, size. But it's significant. It's only a third of the size. Well, it's more than a third. Of the, it's 40 percent of the size of the of, of the, the Yankee. No, of the Vermont. Oh, uh, the the uh, Northfield, Northfield station. Hydro. Yeah. I looked at the article here. Yeah. It's very much like the Northfield yeah, station. Yeah. It's basically like the Northfield station. Yeah. If you take a look at that picture there. Yeah. That's Loch Ness. It's a mile wide at that point. Yeah. Okay. So it's on the other, it's other side. It's on the other bank. Yep. And there is a lake over there now. It's a real lake. And yeah. It's up high. Yeah. Up high. It's going to be part of this. And in all the connections between that lake and Loch Ness, going to be underground. They're going to be buried. So there's not going to be much that you can see from anywhere around yes. there. You know, if you go down to the, to the uh, Northfield Station, and you drive by it. You don't know it's there. Y you don't notice it's there. No. <clears throat> it, could be a, it, it, it could be a park. It is a park. Well, it actually is, yeah. And all of the, everything's buried. Yep. Everything's underground. But it had twice the capacity of Vermont Yankee nuclear plant. Mm -hmm. so, and it's still running, and the Vermont Yankee isn't. It was put up in order to deal with the fact that Vermont Yankee was inflexible. Which well, is, it was producing energy all night that no one was using. Yeah. So they said, let's save it. And Makes you have sense. to do something with it. <laughs> you have to, you, you don't have the chance, the option of just producing the energy. No, and, no. It, you know. It, you got to do something with you, it or you, it's gone. Yeah. Not only is it gone, it's probably going to destroy something, figuring out a good way to get out of <laughs> it. <laughs> okay. Should we go on? Or? Well, look, the, 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 the bottom line of this article is the visual impact would be minimal. Yeah. Visual impact good. would be minimal. I'm, I'm a little concerned about one thing, and that is when you're moving the amount of water that's in these things, you're going to be, you're going to be uh, destructive to aquatic wildlife. Well, that's true, but this is a very large lake. Yes. Loch Ness is, it's only a mile wide, but it's about 50 miles long. It's a yes. long, skinny lake. Well, they're not going to suck the Loch Ness monster into any intake pipes. I don't think so. <laughs> probably not going to happen. If it does, it'll probably make a mess. But, you know. Okay. Should we Moving go on? Along, yeah. All right. We've got an item for a new economy here. Hope is rational. Germany's radical shift to renewables and efficiency. Fossil fuels lobbyists might deny it, but the world is now heading toward a complete decarbonization of the energy system. 
It might seem daunting or even impossible, but recent innovations in megatrends make it possible to keep global warming below 2 degrees Celsius. Well, the article's pretty optimistic. Yep. And it seems the way it's read, it's pretty it's well justified. Yeah. Uh, community concern about climate change has played, this is from the article, played a key role in driving the change in our energy systems. Yes. So they're paying attention to the people somewhat. Yep. If we combine the shift to renewables with investment in energy efficiency, it will deliver huge savings on energy bills. Duh. Right. <laughs> you know. <clears throat> we must roll out renewable energy, but we shouldn't roll out more than we need. Is that <laughs> what you were just saying? Yeah. Um, I, this is very optimistic. It basically, um, I mean, Tom, you and I are, are both pretty optimistic, I think, that we can deal with climate change. I, I think certainly so. Certainly I am. And this, this We've got to recognize it as we, an official fact and go to work on it. But yes. We, people are moving in that direction. The, the things that bother me about climate change are not so much whether we can get to uh, deal with it, whether we will. But no, when we will. Because we the will. longer we put it off, the more destruction there's going to be. Yeah, got a point there. And we are losing species already at a rate of about one every 10 minutes. We'll talk about that. Yeah. That's, that's an article coming up. Well, we've got, a, we've got the, the doom of fossil fuels. We've got another investment picture coming, coming up, up going, along, going along with this. So there's, a, there's something that's going to become extinct. Yeah, yeah, donkey engine. Donkey engine, a nodding donkey. <laughs> That's an oil rig, in case you didn't know. Yeah. The doom of fossil fuel investments. The, well, I'll say that again. The doom of fossil fuel investments. Right. This is uh, from Clean Technica. There is very little time to get out of pure play oil and gas company on investments without substantial losses. Stranded it is, assets. It is already too late to get out of pure play coal company investments without substantial losses. Utility companies with heavy reliance on fossil fuels are also in trouble, and this article explains why. It's a long, very long article. It's, it's very in depth. Long. It's very, it's I very mean, very in depth. If you want to learn about what's going on, take the time <laughs> out to read this article. Read the article. If you are managing any kind of portfolio of investments that has any connection with energy, read the article because it is written by a person who knows what he's talking about and it explains well, in they, they great got, detail. They've got six points they're talking about here and I think we have time enough to talk about do them, it. so I'll do it yeah. quickly. Oil demand is mostly for cars and trucks and will be destroyed by electric cars and trucks. Yes. That's coming, guys. Oh, I, we, we have the most wonderful <laughs> article for next week about we? elect, biggest EVs on Earth. Good, good. Yeah. That'll be fun. These things are gigantic. I'm talking about mining equipment. Aha. Uh -huh. That'll be interesting. <laughs> yeah. Well, the second item here is electricity will be primarily generated by solar and wind as they will be cheaper than fossils. That's they happening already. already are. <laughs> Coal demand is mostly for electricity already being destroyed by natural gas will be further destroyed by cheap solar and wind. Right. Coal, gas demand for heating will be destroyed by electric heat pumps. All these things are happening as we it's speak. It's all going on right now. The residual demand, and this is for airplanes, steel making, plastics, and stuff like that, will not be enough to prevent the extraction and refining companies from losing enormous amounts of money over the next couple of decades. Leave Actually, it in the ground, folks. I got news for you. I don't <laughs> think it's going to be the next couple of decades. Yeah. I think it's going to be the next few years. Utilities will do badly if they bet on fossil fuels and will do well if they invest in low-priced solar, wind, and batteries. Yeah. Well, I think they're aware of that. Most of them are. Some of them are not, I suspect, yeah. and the ones well, that are not they're, are, they're in, aware are in just trouble. But, you know, after all the trouble we used to have with, with energy, energy is investing in, in renewable energy. And we're going to be talking about that. Yep. Or, or, are we not? We are. Okay. We're up to Tuesday. This might be one of them. I don't yep. think this is this it is coming up. But not this yet. This is 11 renewable energy suitors for Rhode Island. This is from PV Magazine USA. And, and we we're going to hit this again, too. Yeah. We're up to Tuesday, November 20th. Rhode Island Governor Gina Raimondo's goal of one gigawatt of renewables by the end of 2020 has taken a 400 megawatt step. The state's 400 megawatt request for proposals received a total of 441 project bids from 11 developments, the developers. 
the the project. This is are, only one of three things that are happening. Yeah, here, all pretty big. Yeah, so the, we're talking about a gigawatt here. Yeah, we are. The projects. This is you know in addition to the, this is in addition to the 350 megawatts that we were talking about earlier. Earlier. In the show. So the 350 project, plus 400. Yep. Plus <laughs> whatever is left. The projects cumulatively come to 2.5 gigawatts of capacity. Now this is, as I said, from PV Magazine. This is they they're going to pick from 250 gigawatts of. So the proposals are 250 if you total them all up. Yep. But they're only looking. For they're one only gigawatt. looking for for 40 400 megawatts in, in this, this particular, particular case. Yeah. Okay. So you I know, I mean, this is this is uh, there's a lot of interest in doing this. Well, the wind projects in this proposal are all massive. They're all and massive. all offshore. Yeah. Ranging from 100 megawatts through 350 megawatts. Right. I wouldn't say that's massive. I'd say they're large. They're large. <laughs> yep. The solar projects, which are much smaller, range from 20 megawatts through 170 megawatts, which is big for solar. That's big. The 20 megawatt solar is coupled with battery storage. Well, we ultimately couple, they all will be. Yeah, uh, you could couple any of these with battery storage, and this is you know just something that's happening in New England. Should well, we, we go got on? We've another picture coming we up. We do indeed, and this is an article from the New York Times. And this is the remains of a forest when they converted it to making palm oil. Yeah, it's a mess. This, isn't is, it? this wasn't the result of a forest fire, although there were fires involved. Yeah. Palm oil mm -hmm. was supposed to save the planet. Instead, it unleashed a catastrophe. Now, didn't we have a guy here very early on in the show that was involved in palm oil? Yes, we did. Who was it and what was, was he um, saying? Uh, uh, Tomas Fricke. Okay. He's he's a, a German man who who lives in Brattleboro part of the time and in Bali part of the time. Yeah, because he was talking about being down in Southeast yes. Asia. Yes, and what he was doing was he was taking the palm oil kernels that were go, that going to market, and what happens is they get, some of them are bruised, and they go bad. And what he was doing was he was getting the bruised kernels. I, I believe this is my recollection. He's sort of salvaging them. Salvaging them and making them into palm oil that could be used as fuel. And so That's he, what this article's about basically. It's the not fuel. salvaging, but it's the fuel aspect yeah. of it. And what but he what he was doing was salvaging was stuff that he wasn't cutting forests down. Well this is a long, very long article. Yep. It's very informative. There's a lot of pictures and yep. if you got the time, it's well worth reading. It's worth reading. The tropical rainforests of uh, Indonesia have large amounts of carbon trapped within their trees and soil. However, slash, slashing and burning the existing for, uh, forests to make way for palm oil cultivation has had a perverse effect. It releases more carbon. Well, there's a little, little bit of a takeaway here, the backstory. A decade ago, the U.S. mandated the use of vegetable oil in biofuels. Right. Okay? Leading to industrial scale deforestation, which is what that picture is. I'll bring the picture up. Yeah. And a huge spike in carbon emissions. Right. Now, the fields look as if they've just been cleared by armies, and that one certainly does. None of the old growth remains, only charred stumps. Villages burned it all down, clearing the way for a lucrative crop whose cultivation now dominates Borneo. The oil palm tree, yeah, and it go. The article goes downhill from there. It's, well, this it's, isn't an optimistic it's, article. No, it's not. It's it's. This is making a, a huge mess, and probably the best thing they could do for the planet would be to cut all those palm trees down, for the palm oil trees mm -hmm. down, and replant what, what had been there before. Well, the item that coming up now is the last item we have. It is because we're we're, we're recording we're only on one day short. Yeah, we're this week. we're one day short, and I I only. Scheduled 18 articles. I'm going to have to be more careful next week and have, get 21 articles out of eight days. But <laughs> we'll squeeze how we do it. Yeah. Okay. Exelon opposes Trump Mercury rule rollback. This is an interesting. Did we talk about Exelon? Uh, not this. Not today. I don't think. Well, Never. it's a conglomerate in the energy business. Right. It's very large and very not large. to be confused with Exxon. No. Uh, this is an article from Clean Technica. After the Trump administration's proposed a plan to roll back a rule limiting the amount of mercury coal generating stations can release into the environment. Exelon, one of the largest electricity generators in the country, sent representatives to meet with EPA officials in opposition to the plan. So Exelon is a big, big 
utility that operates widely over the United States, and it it's, is it's, it's a conglomerate. It's, it's a, yeah. It's, they own utilities. They own right. about six of them, I think. Yeah. And they're all big. They're, they're all, all big. significant. Exelon is a huge company. And one of the things that I, I think this is particularly interesting to people in Vermont for a reason that many people are unaware of, and that is Vermont used to have its own fishery. Did it really? Yeah. Where? Lake, Lake Champlain? Champlain. Lake Champlain. Commercial fishery. It had a commercial fishery. Okay. And you could get fresh fish in places like Burlington and so forth. Yeah. Um, Why be not? Because people went out commercially and fished the lake. They don't do that anymore. That fishery has been destroyed. And Why? Because of mercury in the lake. And that mercury came from power plants in the Midwest. Yeah. Yep. Now, what happens here is... They, they got high stacks in the Midwest. It goes way the heck up they there. They put the stacks up so it doesn't come down locally. On them, yeah. On them. But it comes down here. But it comes down here. And what, what happens is you, you, if you burn coal, there are things in the coal that vaporize. And mercury happens to vaporize at a fairly low temperature. Don't roll off the stage. <laughs> no, I'm okay. You are? Okay. Mercury happens to vaporize at a fairly low temperature. So it'll go into, it, it'll just become uh, atoms, but it doesn't burn easily. So it becomes mercury atoms. And those mercury atoms go up the stack and out. And because they're single atoms in the atmosphere, they're pretty heavy, but they still get blown around and they travel long distances, hundreds of miles. Yeah. And so what do they do? They get to a place where it's raining or something like that. And they attach themselves to rain droplets and they fall to the ground. And so all over New England, we've got beautiful water sources. You've talked about a, a stream in Vermont, in uh, New Hampshire. I was just about to mention that. Yeah. It's, it's right near, I think it's on Route 10. Okay. And you drive by the road, and there's a little parking place where you got access to the river. And there's a sign there that says, do not eat fish from these waters. Yeah. And because of mercury. Because of mercury. And I forget the name of the chemical compound that is, that the mercury gets bound into okay. in the waters. but the, this Nobody recognized it if you remembered it anyhow. <laughs> there are a few people who would. <laughs> Nevertheless, what happens is this chemical is, is um, water soluble, but it gets bioaccumulated. Okay. So, you know, small animals, uh, uh, small crustaceans like cyclops and, and daphnia. Have you ever seen a daphnia? No, I, I don't know. They're very know. funny looking. They, they, they look have like a, a cup? No, they have a face, and it almost looks like a little human face. I have seen it. Yeah. Yep, and, I have seen and it. And they have, they have antlers that are like <laughs> this, only they aren't antlers. And they, these little antlers are going like this constantly to whisk water by yeah, their yeah, mouth yeah, yeah. so yep. that they can intake. These, these are tiny. Little they're, they're tiny. You can see them. Uh -huh. <clears throat> the, the biggest ones are a little smaller than a lentil. But the ones smaller than a what? Lentil. Oh, that's pretty it's big. It's pretty big. This, the ones that we have he, around here are definitely much bigger than a pinhead, and you can you can you can see the these little uh, see the faces. Huh? Yeah. Well, no, not really. But with a magnifying glass, you can. You don't need to get anything sophisticated. But anyway, these little animals pick the mercury up. Bigger animals eat them. Bigger animals eat them. Bigger animals eat them. And it bioaccumulates in these animals as it as it goes up the food chain. So what what is the the most poisonous f fish in the water? I think it's tuna. It's well in the Lake Champlain. It's going to be landlocked salmon, or it's going to be trout, or it's going to be something like that. And the and the the result of that is the very fish that you would want to eat are the worst. Are the worst. Wow. And the deal is, if you, if you go to any, um, uh, if you want to go fishing in Vermont, the correct thing to do is to go to the uh, uh, fishery people on, online and look for a chart that tells you about mercury safety. And it'll tell you what kinds of fish so you can look up on a map. You can look it up, and it'll tell you what kinds of fish where to, to go, avoid where not and to what go. waters. Yeah. And depending on whether you're a child or a pregnant woman on the one hand or anybody else on the other, how many fish of what kind can be eaten. And if you're talking about 
trout in Lake Champlain, if it's a record-breaking big trout, don't, don't eat touch it. it. Wow. Okay. On. We are at the end of our show. I think we are. And we are at the end of our time. So it's time to say goodbye. I'm going to put us up here. Put so us up there. Wave. So that we can wave. <laughs> See you next. Oh, here we go. See you next time. Have a lovely week. Bye-bye.